Donald Trump. The only president who combines the sordid extramarital affairs of a young JFK with the dead-eyed puffiness of a post-Watergate Richard Nixon. <laughs> and look, I know we have talked about Trump a lot on this show, but tonight we'd like to do it from a slightly different angle, and that is focusing on his relationship with the world. Because while we were away, you may remember one particular remark he made. According to the US president, Africa is a shithole. That's right. He said that. He absolutely said that. Except, to be fair to him, it's actually worse, because he reportedly called Africa, Haiti and El Salvador shitholes, which is just not OK. And I do acknowledge that I personally have called Belgium a shithole multiple times, but <laughs> in my defence, A, I'm not president, and B, Belgium is a loathsome chocolate gulag with no objective reason to exist. <laughs> so you can see that it's very different. You can see that. And look, you probably saw people on US TV being justifiably appalled by those remarks, but what you may not have seen is the response from the countries he insulted. I am honestly so shocked. <laughs> countries, like, has he ever been to this country to call it a <laughs> country? Seriously. We're not shit home. We people. We just like him. He is a shit, yes. Because it doesn't matter what you have, he's still going to the same hole where the same worms will eat him too. Wow. <laughs> You know, it says something about the Trump era that the phrase, the same worms will eat him too, actually qualifies as a hopeful thought. <laughs> I would honestly like that crocheted on a pillow so I can wake up to it every morning. <laughs> and look, look, it is not like that's the only time that Trump's remarks have caused an international uproar. He said that Korea used to be part of China, which outraged South Koreans. He claimed that Germany owes NATO vast sums of money, which it does not. And in the UK, he retweeted these anti-Muslim videos from a far-right British group, which triggered massive condemnation. And instead of fully apologising for it, he said, it was a big story where you are, but it was not a big story where I am. And that is exactly his attitude. If it wasn't big where I could see it, then it wasn't big. So forget mastering foreign affairs. Trump may not have mastered object permanence, which <laughs> you really need to be a good president or even a good fucking baby. <laughs> and yet, here is the crucial thing. The rest of the world continues to exist whether Trump acknowledges it or not. So tonight, let's try and answer a few basic questions. First, what is... Donald Trump's foreign policy, because it seems to be little more than repeating a single phrase. America first. America first. America first. Again, America first. America first. It will be America first from now on. America first. Now, if you are another country watching that, you may well be wondering, wait, when has America's attitude ever not been America first? <laughs> They've been putting America first since the day they arrived in America, very much second. But, but to, hear, to hear Donald Trump tell it, in recent years, we've been getting the short end of the stick. On the campaign trail, he often complained that America had become a global punchline and promised that he could reverse that. The world is laughing at us, folks. The whole world is laughing at us. They're laughing at this at what's going on in our country. The world laughs at us, folks. The world laughs at us. We're not going to be a laughing stock like we have been, and we have been, believe me. Oh, <laughs> we're not going to be a laughing stock anymore, huh? <laughs> it is insane that Trump, this guy, this guy, <laughs> this guy, thought he would end the laughter. It's like a flamingo in boxer shorts named Phineas J. Rocket Dump ran for president under the slogan, Time to Get Serious. <laughs> now, for the record, since Trump became president, if anything, the world is laughing harder than ever before. Because while all US presidents do get made fun of, impersonating Trump has become an international cottage industry. Israel has Trump kicking a Muslim man while dancing lewdly to Guns N' Roses. Germany has him dancing to Uptown Funk. Spain has him flipping off the world and again dancing like an idiot. And there's more. Here he is in Pakistan. Here he is in Bulgaria. Here he is in Taiwan. Here he is in Ethiopia. Here's a pretty shitty one from Turkey where they're not even trying. Here's a Korean Trump. And here's one from an Italian comedy show singing Born in the USA on a stealth fighter before being taken out with a bucket on his head. <laughs> Are any of these funny? I don't know. Is anything about Trump funny anymore? Somehow the world's most objectively laughable human has become a comedy graveyard where laughter goes to die. 
<laughs> and, and in case you think any of that may have been good-natured ripping, a recent Gallup poll shows that the world's approval rating of US leadership has dropped to 30% after being at nearly 50% just two years ago. That is a precipitous drop in popularity. It's the equivalent of replacing Gal Gadot in the Wonder Woman franchise with Matt Lauer. And, <laughs> and look, I know, I know that Donald Trump and others may not give a shit about what the world thinks about us, but they really should for a number of reasons. Chief among them, something called soft power, which, yes, I acknowledge, does sound like an erectile dysfunction medication for chinchillas. <laughs> so soft, yet so hard. <laughs> but, but basically, basically it refers to the ability to get others to do what you want them to do without using carrots or sticks. It's kind of a, a country's brand. And a nation's soft power can come from many sources, from your pop culture, uh, to the ideals you express, to your reputation. And diplomacy can play a major part in it. Even hard power practitioners, like Trump's own Secretary of Defense, Jim Mad Dog Mattis, supports the soft power work that's done by the State Department. That is why, a few years back, he gave a full-throated defense of properly funding it. Frankly, uh, they need to be as, as fully funded as Congress believes appropriate because uh, if you don't fund the State Department fully, then I need to buy more ammunition, ultimately. Now, that is scary, because buy more ammunition is his way of saying, without diplomacy, there will be more wars. He doesn't need more ammunition so he can make more bullet earrings for his Etsy store, <laughs> because he's not just Secretary of Defense, he also crafts accessories for the elegant weirdo. <laughs> now, unfortunately, though, Trump has shown little interest in soft power. His administration recently proposed a 29% cut to the State Department and foreign aid. And there are many high-level vacancies at the State Department to say nothing of our lack of ambassadors. From Belgium to Belize, South Korea to South Africa, President Trump has a problem. His embassies have no ambassador. Turkey, Jordan, Egypt, Qatar and Saudi Arabia, all without ambassadors. Holy shit! South Korea, Turkey and Saudi Arabia, those are countries where you really need an ambassador. It's not like Liechtenstein, where you can basically scrape by with a sign that says, never stop Liechtensteining. <laughs> and as for the ambassadors that Trump has appointed, some of them are frankly not great. When Trump appointed Pete Hoekstra ambassador to the Netherlands, they were a little upset over there, as this interview shows. Speaking of threat, at one point you mentioned in a uh, debate that there are no-go zones in the Netherlands and that cars and politicians are being set on fire in the Netherlands. I didn't say that. That, that, that is no? actually an incorrect statement. Um, yeah. yeah, we would call it fake news. OK, OK, I didn't say that. So, so he's given himself some wiggle room there, as long as he didn't say exactly what the reporter just claimed about no-go zones and politicians being set on fire. He's technically correct. The only thing in the whole world that would make him not correct is if, say, video of him saying <laughs> that cars and politicians are being burned and that, yes, there are no-go zones in the Netherlands. There are cars uh, being burned, there are politicians that are being burned, and, yes, there are no-go zones in the Netherlands. It's pretty weird not to recall saying out loud there are politicians that are being burned in the Netherlands. It's not the kind of thing that you do and immediately forget about, like driving to work or seeing the movie The Post. I mean, <laughs> I, I have a vague memory of walking into a darkened room, eating milk duds and thinking Meryl Streep is a treasure, but the rest is a complete blank. <laughs> but when Trump was asked about his understaffed State Department, he claimed that it didn't really matter for one key reason. Let me tell you, the one that matters is me. I'm the only one that matters, because when it comes to it, that's what the policy is going to be. I'm the only one that matters. The only one that matters is me. It's hard to tell if Donald Trump is laying out a diplomatic strategy or demanding that Daddy buy him an Oompa Loompa now! <laughs> but OK, OK, if Trump is the only one that matters, then his actions are critical to our nation's foreign policy. And that brings us to our next question. How is his approach to the world going? And the answer, surprisingly, is great. And now, this. Wait, 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 I'm kidding. It's been a fucking disaster. <laughs> In fact, to give you a sense of how much damage he can do in very little time... I can't believe you nearly bought that! <laughs> to give you a sense of how much damage he can do in very little time, 
Just look at last summer's back-to-back -back NATO and G7 summit. It was just three days off meetings, in which time he reportedly told European leaders that, quote, the Germans are bad, very bad, <laughs> then shook Emmanuel Macron's hand so aggressively it seemed <laughs> like he was trying to masturbate an elephant. <laughs> Then, at the G7 conference the next day, world leaders unsuccessfully tried to convince him to stay in the Paris Climate Accord, and in the middle of all of that, he gave a speech where he failed to explicitly reaffirm Article 5, the basic principle that NATO members should come to the aid of each other when attacked. Affirming it is routine for presidents, and it was even in Trump's speech until being apparently deleted at the very last minute, blindsiding top members of his own national security team. And after witnessing Trump's erratic behaviour for just Three days, Angela Merkel was so shell-shocked, she made this statement. The times when we could completely rely on others are, to an extent, over. I've experienced this in the last few days, and that's why we Europeans must really take our fate into our own hands. That was the day after the summit. Merkel wasn't even supposed to give a major speech. That was at a campaign event held in a beer tent. And that means we're probably lucky there was an event of any kind, otherwise she would have just yelled out, Europe is on its own at her nephew's piano recital. <laughs> and, and this brings us to our final question. What are the consequences of this? Well, one big one of them could be that there is a leadership vacuum in the world. So who will fill that? Well, in Europe, the obvious candidate is Germany. But even they know that there may be an issue with that. Well, whenever I talk to people in our neighbour countries, they mostly expected sort of a leadership of Germany. But on the other side, whenever I talk to the people in these countries with a very good memory what happened in the first uh, half of the 20th century, they are very reluctant talking about a German leadership. You're right. You're right. I I'm so glad that you brought that up, because I, I didn't want to be the first one to bring it up, but you are absolutely right. When people hear... Germany wants to take a leading role in Europe, but most of us do still think, no, they're still in timeout, and they know why. <laughs> they know what they did. Naughty Germany. <laughs> now, now, globally, it seems that China is set to be the biggest beneficiary, because they have been aggressively seeking to increase their influence and soft power, something that has not gone unnoticed. An Asian head of government recently explained to me that at every regional conference, Washington sends a couple of diplomats whereas Beijing sends dozens. The Chinese are there at every committee meeting, and you are not, he said. The result, he explained, is that Beijing is increasingly setting the Asian agenda. It's true. The US is absent at many important meetings, and that doesn't even include meetings that Jared Kushner was supposed to attend, but he couldn't find the room, and he was too shy to ask someone, and then he realised it was too late anyway, so he just killed an hour wandering around the lobby pretending to be on the phone. <laughs> And, and the thing is, China's increased influence should be alarming because they are an autocratic country. You don't necessarily want China setting global priorities on things like human rights and democracy. And yet, Trump's reckless behaviour is opening the door to exactly that happening. Not to mention the fact that what he's doing is going to make it harder for him to accomplish his own goals. He wants to contain North Korea? Well, to do that, you might want to appoint an ambassador to South Korea. He wants Germany to spend more on its military? OK, but maybe stop publicly shaming Merkel if you want her to be able to sell that idea back home. And if he wants to contain security threats like ISIS and Al-Shabaab in African countries, then maybe don't call African countries fucking shitholes. <laughs> and, and that is the thing here. Trump can say that he doesn't care because his approach is America first, but you need allies to get anything done. Foreign affairs is like sex. If you loudly announce that you will always come first, you're going to have trouble finding partners. <laughs> and, and as for Trump's other promise, that the world will stop laughing, it is not just comedians doing that, it's world leaders. Australian Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull was at a press dinner last year, and he had himself a bit of fun. Donald and I, we are winning and winning in the poll. <laughs> You know, the online polls. They are so easy to win. I have this Russian guy. <laughs> the 
believe me, it's true. It is true. That is a key ally using the fact that our president is a pathological liar as a punchline and crushing that room like a fourth grader with a carrot stick stuck up his nose. <laughs> And if you think that was grim, let me show you one more clip we found when we were looking for Trump impersonators around the world. This one is from Russian TV, with a comedian making fun of Trump's suspiciously close relationship to Putin. And there is a fun little surprise for you just at the end. Hillary. The other day, Hillary asked me, Donald, do you love Russia? I answered, yes, I do. I love Russia. But you have no evidence against me. <laughs> as happy as I've ever seen Putin, ever. I guess at least we now know what type of humour that Putin likes. He likes the kind where he meddles in another country's election, succeeds, has a joke about it made to his face in public and then realises it all worked out and no one can touch him. That's the kind of humour that Putin likes. It just creases him up. Look, I know that all of this is depressing because it seems like America's reputation overseas is under attack from its own president, which is just ridiculous. Soft power is an act of salesmanship. It's selling your brand. It is the one thing that Trump is supposed to be good at, and he's fucking blowing it. So as an immigrant who has fallen in love with this country, for what it's worth, please allow me to speak to the rest of the world in America's defense for a moment, because Donald Trump does not reflect America. I mean, to be, to be completely honest, to be completely honest, he, he does reflect it a bit, but... The point is, America is not one thing. It's a beautiful mess of contradictions where good and bad are mixed together. On one hand, it makes Mountain Dew, which tastes like a honeydew melon was fucked by a radioactive clown. <laughs> On the other hand, it also made this awesome bed shaped like the Batmobile. You can fall asleep in that thing and be Batman if Batman somehow got locked out of the Batcave and had to sleep in his car. But that's the American dream right there. America is the country that came up with YouTube, which, yes, I know, gave you in the world that shithead Logan Paul, but it also gave you those videos of adults in T-Rex suits on dirt bikes, <laughs> ballet dancing, exercising, and doing basic car repairs. <laughs> and, and, by the way, that magnificent dinosaur costume, that's an American idea, too. The, the point is, America is the country that gave you Star Wars, you're welcome, and Scientology, we're sorry about that. And, and sometimes what's great and terrible about us is just impossible to separate. Like, like Popeye's chicken. It's objectively disgusting, but I would run across traffic to eat this shit. <laughs> the, the point is, Trump is the worst of us, yes, but he's not all of us. If I did distill America down to one sound, it wouldn't be the braying voice of Donald Trump screaming America first. It would be the gorgeous voices of the New York City Gay Men's Chorus singing this song. Somebody once told me the world is gone around. That's right. I That's All Star by Smash Mouth. A terrible, stupid song being sung absolutely beautifully. This should be our new national anthem. And so, please, world, for the next three or seven or somehow 11 years, please remember this is the country of Donald Trump, yes, but it's also the country of people profoundly embarrassed by it and the country that brought you inflatable dinosaur costumes and fucking Batman beds.